is a Okay, good morning. Okay, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Gracious God, we ask your blessing on our gathering again as we ponder the wonder of your gift of the Bible, your word, our risen Savior, and our own experience daily in the struggle to know you and love you and serve you. We hope that gathering regularly, encountering your word in this community of faith, may draw us more deeply into the mystery of your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, folks, what's what's it, what's the bug going around this late bug? It's uh, ten after, eleven after. No more. This is the last time. Okay. Uh, Everybody, we gotta go. We gotta catch up with the lost time now. I I want to start off with a little story that will lead to, to something else. When I was pastor at uh, St. Cyril's St. Clair's Parish in uh, about 1984 to 89, at that particular period, and that that time it was under that name. I had a group of of uh, members. And the, who had some really good training in liturgy, and they were the liturgy committee, and they were also uh, members of the choir. And one of the things that they really understood is that that Sunday readings and prayers of that liturgy brought a theme, and the music was to meet it and express that theme. And they would get together and fight for two and a half or three hours about which songs we were gonna sing. And that was their big task. They forgot all about the other parts of the liturgy, but they were really good at getting the songs connected with the theme and what was more important, the life of the community, the experience of the people. And they knew what they wanted to say, and they all had different points of view, very strong personalities. And uh, eventually they'd get their songs together. And after an hour, I left and said, see, I can't uh, I'm, I'm, I know you're going to do a good job. But that, it was a very wonderful and eventful meeting every time, but it, it had real depth and beauty about the music, but it missed a lot of other parts of the liturgy. But the strength and the beauty of, of their choices of songs was related very strongly to the experience of the people. And that was, the, that was the real blessing of, of this group, that they tied the music into the, into the life of the people. Now, I had hoped today to, to uh, make a presentation on the Psalms. And the Psalms are pretty much what those women were doing. They were prayers that developed over a long history that were telling the story of the people and relating to the experience of the people. Sometimes up, sometimes down, sometimes excited, sometimes celebrating a wedding or celebrating a funeral or celebrating a crisis or celebrating a victory, whatever, the Psalms do the whole human scene. And, but they're very complicated. Now I have a question. In your many years it is listening to these priests preach, have the priests ever really gotten you excited about the Psalms? Yes. No, the Psalms. So, no, they have. We pray, the priests pray the Psalms every day. We say what we call the office, the breviary. And, and 
It's because we don't know the signs that you don't hear about them. And, and as I began to study, I said, there's, there's really a fundamental point that's missing here. And, and so I want to go to that point on the class today, and then I'll make an effort next week to do the Psalms. I'm not terribly enthused about that I'm going to be successful, uh, but I'm going to work at it and, and do the best I can. So, so today, in preparation for teaching the Psalms, I want to uh, give a, a, a class that's different. I want to talk about prayer. Now, if I ask you a question, which I'm going to ask you, <laughs> is what do you hope to accomplish when you pray? What do you want to do when you pray? And I would answer that if not now, most of your life, you are praying to change God to fit your program. And you were telling God as if he didn't know what you needed. And especially what you wanted. And and so, that's not what prayer is. But that's what the majority of, of, of the way people pray. And so, I have dealt with this problem in a blog. I call it uh, Praying Alone Together. And, and it's about what I call deep personal prayer. And it's a way of approaching prayer that makes God the center and us the creature. Rather than God being a sugar daddy waiting for our pitch to listen to what we need. And uh, so the delivery company has given a raise for the delivery man. So they, they get uh, a lot of extra bonus. No, oh, I might tell you they're they're good. There's a lot over here. There. No, they're all seventy-three pages. Just give them them out like this. Yeah. Okay. So while they're they're delivering this, the one thing. I want to go real quickly over a, a, a point that, that needs to be stated, and then we'll, we'll come back to it some other day. In the spiritual life, in the long tradition of the Catholic Church, we have experienced that people are in three groups. They're beginners. They're perfect, proficient, they're the middle group, the, we call them proficient, and then the perfect. And, and it's a journey to move out of the beginners to the proficient, to the really fulfilling a, a, a deep accomplishment in your prayer. The interesting thing is, when people are in the perfect stage, they understand themselves as real beginners. Because they see how good, how great, how wonderful God is, and how what a poor sinner they are. They see it more clearly. Whereas other people, the first thing they read it, oh, I think I'm moving into the proficient. Oh, I'm almost in the perfect. And, and uh, that's human nature. That's, that's, that's stuff that needs to be cleaned up. But, so, the point is this, about that. We all receive the information about spirituality, about prayer, about the Bible. We all receive it in the category that we are in. 
So if I teach you the Bible and I'm teaching everybody in this class the same thing, the people who are beginners receive it one way, the people who are proficient receive it a totally different way. And the people who are perfect receive it a completely different way. It's just the way it is. That's, and, and what it's measured by is the, the, the power of God in being present and free in your heart. As your heart expands and you give more space to God, you begin to see and hear things differently. And that's, that's what these three stages are about, is, is there's the, the stages of growth. And, and so as you read that stuff on the paper, you you're all read the same things, but you'll receive it differently according to your spiritual development. Like this. So that's just the basic foundational point, okay? So let me uh, work on this. And this is, there's six pages here. I'm going to try to summarize most of it. I'll read some of it and summarize some of it. But what I'm trying to get across is this. The whole process of maturing, of growing in a deeper, more spiritual understanding of prayer is taking the emphasis off ourselves and putting the emphasis on God. Your experience in this Bible class has been expressed to me countless times. And I don't stop and tell everybody, oh, I understand. But what you're telling me is this. The Bible class has helped you to open your life to understand your experience of God. And we got names for it, and we got other things. But when you say, oh my God, yes, that, that's, that speaks to, to my, my struggle. That, that speaks to, when it speaks to you, it's speaking that God is in your life. He isn't going to come when you pray. God is already there, has been there from the beginning and will be there to the end. And God cannot love you more than he does. It, it's impossible for God to love you more than he does. And you are working trying to get God to love you. Saying you're not ready for it or whatever. But God, God ain't, ain't, ain't holding back. It's us that's holding back. And, and, and so we need to understand that. And the way we approach prayer is, is a very, very important part of that. So here's a, uh, in, the, in the front page, uh, page number one. Here's the words that Pope Francis uh, said in, uh, recently. The Lord tells us the first task in life is prayer. But not the prayer of words, like a parrot, but the prayer of the heart, gazing on the Lord, hearing the Lord, and asking the Lord. Amen. And we'll come back to that. Hearing and gazing and asking. Okay, and this, these papers that I'm giving you uh, are about deep personal prayer. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to try to explain that. Uh, so the Catholic, on page 2, the definition of prayer in the Roman Catholic Catechism, and prayer is raising one's mind and heart to God or the requesting of good things from God. Our good things often conflict with God's good things. A significant, a significant part of the Christian life is learning to discern the difference and the importance of our self-perceived good things and the good things of God. More often than not, our good things are wrapped up in the false values of a materialistic and consumer-driven culture rather than the values of the gospel. And so, that's no easy task. I can lay it out clearly in here. But to really understand what you want and what God wants, that's a big journey to, to, to make the connection so they're together. And, and we all need to grow in that, okay? And so that's why 
you are coming to the Bible class because you want to learn what God wants. And when you do, it gets you excited. And if you weren't excited about it, you wouldn't be here. That's absolutely, you want a deeper experience of God. And you come and say, Father Tracy, that class was good. Well, that's good. It's good because I'm helping you get a, a deeper experience of God. That's as simple as that. That's how it all works. And you could go to Mass 50 times and it doesn't click. And if you come to a, a class and then it clicks, you say, I'd rather go to the class than go to Mass. <laughs> But the class is no good unless it helps you understand that the mass is really where it's at. So, so it's a it's a very complicated stuff. But I've been spending sixty years working on it, and so I, I think I got a little bit of an insight. So, second paragraph, our good our good things. Okay, now third paragraph. For most people, a good part of their journey as Christians is searching. Uh, 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 and searching people, by that I mean Christians and other people who are of no religion have the same struggle that you're, you're doing about experiencing God. Because God is present to everybody. God doesn't have any Catholics or Protestants. They're all God's children. There are no Hindus or Muslims. There are only God's children. And, and and we need to grow an understanding that that, that it's uh, uh, God is 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 not Catholic. We were spent centuries saying God was Catholic, <laughs> and God is better than Catholic. <laughs> okay, so we are clear with what we want and what we think we need. It is like an adult list for Santa. However. Through the experience of life's many trials and more loving awareness of the wisdom and beauty of the gospel, we gradually, and I mean gradually, very slowly, we, we, we see the need for change. This eventually leads to a long, costly process of letting go and letting God. We become serious about making God the center of our lives. This spiritual growth is one of the important functions of the journey to contemplative prayer. Deep personal prayer plays a critical role in that transformation. And that's what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about taking your prayer as you, as you experience it and believe me, believe me, if we were able to really have a clean sheet of how each of you prays, it's all very different. But it's all with the help of the Holy Spirit. And it's all the same God. And it's the same love. And it's the same grace. Yes. And, and so how we all pray is different. But what we do have is a good, rich, beautiful tradition in our Catholic faith that's, I'll ask you a question. How many times has any any program in the parish really stopped and said, here's how you pray? <clears throat> I bet you very few of you have had a, an experience where, oh, come to, to this and we'll teach you how to pray. We don't do that. And that's really, really neglectful on our part. Okay? That's why I have this blog going uh, uh, late in my life. I, I, I look back and like you, if, if you have any wisdom, you know you made a lot of mistakes. Well, I made a whole lot of mistakes. I'm trying, trying to do a little bit better. Not that I got the game together. Nobody gets the game together. It's all a struggle for all of us. But we see some things that we can move ahead with. And that, that's what I'm trying to do. Okay. Here's what I use as a definition for prayer. Thomas Merton was a Trappist monk who was a dominant, the dominant figure in the 20th century uh, on spirituality. And he says that prayer then, it means a yearning for the simple presence of God, for a personal understanding of God's word, for knowledge of God's will, and the capacity to hear, to hear, so you got to listen and obey. 
you got to live. If you listen and live, that's what prayer leads to. Listening to God and then living it. Okay? So let me go over that again. Prayer then means yearning for the simple presence of God. We have to become aware of God. We don't bring God down to us by thinking about God. God is present from us from the moment of our existence to, to the moment of our death when we pass through a whole new way of being present to God. But we're all, if God isn't present to us, we don't exist. So that's, that's uh, fundamental. But there's also God is present to us in a deeper loving way that he wants us to be aware of his love and, and we need to grow in our openness and yearning for that love. And that's why we want to understand this, this prayer when it says, uh, uh, it means a yearning for the simple presence, personal understanding of God's word and knowledge of God's will Get the game together and then listen and live. Listen and live, okay? Now, in Merton's definition of prayer, God is the focus. We search for understanding the direction of our lives that will guide us to, toward God. Our call uh, uh, to contemplation becomes clearer in this style of prayer. We find five key points in Merton's definition. Uh, Number one, all prayer must raise our awareness and lead us to pay attention to God's presence. Number two, we need to engage God's word. This first and foremost is done through the Bible, but is also the experience of life. Your stories, your struggles, your, the death of your, your loved ones, the, uh, the accomplishment of your do at work, the, the growth of, of understanding how you help one another, the pain of experiencing the depth of racism in our society, the whole span of your experience is, is uh, uh, the experience of God. It's the experience of God. Number three, the involvement with God's word leads us to God's will. This begins the process of undermining selfishness and encouraging generosity toward God and others. Prayer is critical in this enlightenment. As I, I say, if you look back to the time you were 22 and look at the world the way you see it now, it's different. It's very different. And, and when you're 22, it's all about, I'm going to grab all this and then I'm going to do this and I'm going to get that and I'm going to accomplish this. And now you're just hoping on that you don't, you're not a pain in the butt to somebody else, you know. It's just a, it's a, it's a life, a life is a, is a, a process of just opening up slowly and slowly to know that we are poor, sinful creatures and God is merciful, loving, and forgiving beyond our wildest dreams. If we're on the track, that's what, that's what the story the more you know about God, the more you know you are a sinner. The more you know about God, the more you know that it doesn't make any difference because God loves you the way you are. And loving you the way you are, God wants you to change. God wants you to be a new person. Okay? And prayer is, is the stuff that generates this, this process, this spiritual journey. Number four, in this style of prayer, this prayer I call deep personal prayer, listening is the most important feature. Finally, as we grow in understanding of God's word and seeking God's will, the Spirit directs us to follow Jesus. Always, always, everywhere, at all times. The beginning, the middle, and the end. Follow Jesus. Okay? Now, two little additional points. Teresa of Avila, my Carmelite sister, doctor of the church, says this about prayer. In my opinion, Teresa says, prayer is nothing else than an intimate sharing between friends. 
It means taking time frequently to be alone with him we know loves us. And uh, at Teresa's writings, the emphasis is unquestionably on God who we know loves us. There's a continual growth in that love when we continue to be faithful to Jesus. Okay? So now, section two. Obstacle, an obstacle to deep personal prayer. The prayer of petition. And this is what everybody, not everybody, but a majority of people that come to church, they come to church with an agenda. They, 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 they love meeting the people, the, the, the social part of it, but when it gets down to the serious thing, they want God to take care of their life. They want God to, 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 to uh, keep the problems away and keep prosperity coming. That, uh, and if you, if you uh, don't understand that as a pastor, you're in deep trouble. And the part of the pastor is to draw you away from that draw you into a more spiritual understanding. And if the pastor just makes religion be to serve your vision of God as a sugar daddy, that's a total corruption of a religion. And that happens all the time. It happens all the time. The pastor's very popular because he's telling what you want to hear. And that ain't what Jesus is about. Mm -hmm. Jesus told them what they didn't want to hear, and they put them on the cross. Yep. So that's what we got to work at. Okay, now, there are two fundamental points uh, uh, on the prayer of petition. We start with an awareness of our dependence on God. Second, whatever our petition may be, it must lead to God's plan for our salvation. So whatever we pray for, if it's fitting into the way things should be according to God's will, our prayers should fit God's plan rather than God fitting our plan. And believe me, believe me, it's hard to change that because we are geared, wired, directed, motivated, and moving on with our plan and can't understand why God doesn't understand the world we've That's, 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 so, this is conversion. This is what a conversion is. It's, it's making God the center rather than me the center. That's, that's what the prayer needs to, to, to move towards, okay? Now, uh, we move gradually into deeper levels of, of superstition and magic when we continue with our program. There is a denial of God and a gross distortion of our faith. It is amazing how flawed Christian prayer fades into the same structure of petition practiced in witchcraft. If I say the novena three times on Saturdays and two times on Fridays, God will always answer People are coming up with all kinds of gimmicks. Oh, this prayer, this is the best prayer that ever. Here you go. Here, you don't, if I give you this prayer, they have the little car. You don't even need life insurance. It's all taken care of. <laughs> oh. No, it's witchcraft. It's, it's fancy, but it's witchcraft. It's not, it's not Christian prayer. And there's a lot of it going on. Moving away from a journey of faith and trust we move towards the magical. We create our own image of God as our personal divine manipulator. Okay? And then uh, we become the center and God is there in heaven at our beck and call. Now it is not God's kingdom, but our kingdom that is the front and center. Most often our desires are for security, and elimination of things that make us anxious or anxiety. Usually, our prayer falls into a pattern seeking some form of prosperity, usually defined not by God's kingdom, but by the norms of a consumer society with its assurance of wealth and comfort. Likewise, much prayer is brought on by a crisis, whether personal 
or communal. Okay? So, oh my God, we have a tornado and we see the people that are praying. God, somehow or other, made this world. And we brought sin into the world, and God is living with sin. God is, is living with evil every second of our existence. And when we have a crisis and something happens, we say, oh my God, oh my God, how could this be? It's happening all the time yes. to somebody, yes. all the time. Today is, is a, 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 a day for China, a Japanese, I've used this at the, my mass homily this morning. There was a Japanese doctor who was in Nagasaki. He was working in the hospital and the atomic bomb came and struck the city. They, when we aimed, the, the, there was a time that they, they there was a lot of talk at this at the, after the Second World War. Nagasaki was the only really strong Catholic part of Japan. Yeah. And the, the bomb aimed at the cathedral. Right. And, and uh, boom, a flash, boom. 80,000 people were killed instantly. Instantly. And hundreds of other thousands of people got radiation sickness yes. and they became like lepers in the, in the rest of Japan. So this guy, this doctor, then went and, and worked in the hospital for a day and a half, went home, and they, he saw his wife, her, her bones were disintegrated into dust holding the rosary. And his kids survived, but he got radiation sickness. He quit his his uh, medical career and just got a hut outside where the cathedral and stayed in prayer as a contemplative for five years before he died. Now he's he's going to be he's on the process of being uh, approaching sainthood. But the point of the thing is, God is present to all the evil in the world all of the time. We see these kids on the campuses getting a glimpse of evil and what's going on in Gaza. And they're excited about it, and that's wonderful. But this stuff goes on all the time. We have the people in, in Africa raping the woman and, and, and cutting out their sexual organs, and, and, and it goes on all the time. And God is with this presence, and God had only one answer to all of it, and that was Christ crucified. That was Christ crucified. God came down and said, how am I gonna answer this stuff? And, and Jesus said, the only way I can answer is to enter into the evil. Enter into it, embrace it, and lift it up. And, and that's what, that's what uh, our prayer is to try to get in touch with God's plan. Yes. It's so much better than ours. Yes. It's so much better than ours. Yes. So, so that's that's when we're praying, and it's we're talking about what God wants and what we want. We need to understand God wants it much more than we do, and He wants what is absolutely most perfect and most beautiful and rich and powerful and wonderful for us because God knows what we need. All the other stuff is going to pass away. Yes. It's gone. It's just, it's slipping. And I hate to tell you, but you're all getting older, folks. <laughs> and, you know, it's a, and you notice it's all passing ankle by ankle. And Big Arthur ain't going nowhere. <laughs> He is going to get richer and more powerful in your body. <laughs> and so, so uh, at any rate, uh, let's continue this uh, part two on the top of page four. The church's prayer for a blessing of a new car gives us an important sight, insight into this complex, complex issue of the integrity of prayer of petition. The prayer of blessing makes three points when we bless a car. 
We ask for the safety of those using the vehicle, the responsibility of the driver for the safety of others, and that Christ will always be a companion to those in the vehicle. That's what we pray for. In, in the, so the call for personal responsibility and accountability is critical to all prayer. God expects us to use the talents and gifts we have received. This task of human effort is spelled out beautifully in what we uh, call the transcendental precepts. We express this human effort in the following guidelines for all authentic human activity. Be attentive. By that I mean you got to pay attention to your world. You got to be awake, see what's happening around you. Be intelligent. Use your mind. God gave you a mind, you use it to, to solve your problems and to be reasonable. Be in dialogue with people, talk about it, to understand it and expand your uh, deeper understanding and be responsible and finally be loving. There's a, you could spend five years just working on those, those uh, uh, transcendental precepts. But what's the point? The point is God isn't up there to fix our problems. God gave us the wherewithal to fix our problems. And what God wants us to do is to use our intelligence, use our talent, use our time, and use uh, the, the, the help that we can get wherever we can get to solve our problem. And then go to God when you run up, to, run up against it. But... You, you, that, that's, the, that's, what the, that's the foundation of, of, of petition. Do what you need to do and do it following these precepts. Okay? So, when you were organizing the unions and the, uh, and the community organizers, you didn't go to God and say, oh God, fix this problem. You went out and talked to people, yes. organized, and, and did it. When you were teaching, oh God, teach these little so-and-sos. They... And, and then you go and prayed all day in your class that they would learn? No, you use your talent. You use your time. You use whatever God gave you to try to instruct them in spite of all the hostility you encountered in these lovely little darlings. Uh, so so that's, that's, what, that's what, when we pray for them, we need to pray for them. Always pray for them. But before you pray, do what you can do. That's, that's the point here, okay? And then, in this way, whether driving a car or any other genuine human activity, we are using our humanity as God wants. Only after this engagement should we enter the arena of prayer or petition. By following the precepts, or the transcendental precepts, be attentive, be intelligent, be reasonable, be responsible by loving, only when we follow the precepts, uh, we develop a proper image of God. This is the loving, providential God who operates within the limits of our sinful, broken human condition. God's saving plan was made manifest in the death and resurrection of Jesus. God invites us to share in the great act of love in our service and surrender. Okay, we're getting there. We've got one more, uh, one more page, both sides. This is the final and complete entry into God's loving plan. Along the way, everything we pray for needs to be measured in how it helps to achieve the final good things that is God's will for us. So we always got to come back and say, what does God want for me? Does God really say that I need a new car? Does God say I need this this new thing for my house? Does God say that, oh my God, that's such a wonderful dress. I need three of them. You know, I, I, the advertisers are speaking to you night and day, telling you what you need. If you watch, I, I watch ABC News, and ABC News from 5.30 to 6.00, they have one message in the news, but their big message is this. You will live forever 
if you buy all the pills I'm selling you, you will live forever if you buy these pills. And this is the greatest, newest, finest, wonderful pill that, that does everything, except on the little side, but, but you might die from it. <laughs> yeah, the, the little, the, the small print. So, but the, the, the point is, 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 uh, God is the one that's going to give more benefit, not, not uh, fight for, for whatever is advertising. Yeah, and if you you got new names, if you could name all the names of those new drugs, boy, you you would win Jeopardy backwards and forwards. So, so Jesus has much to say about prayer in the Gospels. In Luke, Jesus makes it very clear how to decide about our concerns and God's concerns. Therefore I tell you, Jesus, this is a quote from, from Luke. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life and what you will eat, or about your body and what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Notice the ravens, they do not sow or reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, yet God feeds them. How much more important are you than the birds? Indeed, seek his kingdom, and these other things will be given to you besides. For where your treasure is, there also will be your heart. Now, here's, here's what I want to stress. We've got to connect that attitude that Jesus gives with the attitude that you aren't getting the paycheck without work. You get to, you got to do both. You got to you got to take care of the business. That's what I'm saying. But you also ultimately ultimately as human beings we got to trust in God. Yes. So how do you get it together? That's where prayer comes in. Prayer helps us to, to understand that help. and it's really it's tremendous wisdom to really be able to bring the two together and and and. Uh, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. But that's that's what what uh, uh, deep personal prayer is, is about. Is bringing that wisdom of the gospel of trust in God and also showing up, paying to get on the bus. You'd say, "Oh, God wants me on the bus." The driver say, "Well, I want you on the street." <laughs> yeah, you know, it just it, it, we got balance those two. We got to balance and and. Uh, uh, that's that's the struggle. And prayer is what 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 helps us balance. So, in all its complexity, the prayer petition comes down to this. You ready? I got the answer. Listen. God is God, and we are creatures. We get that together. We are in business. This is the basis of our relationship with God. As creatures, we are ultimately defined by our mortality resulting from our sinfulness. Our basic petition is for freedom from this bondage that is God's plan for us, a freedom and love in this life that opens to the passage through death to life eternal. Amen. We get in touch with that. That's what Jesus says, I am the way. Okay? Now, last section. God's plan and our plan. Most often, when people pray, their petition fits their plan. They want God to respond when their strategy for happiness needs some help. If everything is going fine, if you're getting a raise, you're getting a new job, you got a new house, you ain't praying much. Because you've got your program together. Something falls apart. Oh God, oh God, help me. No, that, that, that's, that's not what it's about, okay? So, but God also has a plan. And God planned for you and for me. God wants that plan, to, to, wants us to respond to the divine plan. Here's the conflict. Conflict, the two plans, God's and ours. This is a significant problem with prayer. 
However, in the end, this difference can be a great source of life in our prayer. I had my first experience of, of the conflict of two clans in high school. The loss of a championship football game seemed like the end of the world to me. In fact, it was the beginning of a new and ever so wonderful world. After the loss of that final game, I entered what seemed like an unending funk, totally due to my teenage experience. What it was in reality was God making space so I could hear his call to enter the seminary. One of the best decisions in my life. It took me many years to understand that the pain and the anguish of the loss were a true blessing. Life is always coming from death when we walk with Jesus. Now, you all have had hundreds of experiences where you thought it was all a total loss, but with time and wisdom, you were able to see, oh my God, God was with me all along. God was there, and I was just blind. Now, that, that's the, and if you don't do that, it's sad, because that's the way it's supposed to happen. We don't manipulate God. God is embracing us all the time, and sometimes that embrace needs to say, as I said, the, the, the thing that the darkness of, of being lost. I had won the, we had won the city championship three years in a row, and I was the quarterback and the captain on the team that lost. Oh my God, my world was ended. And, and when, what God was saying, I got a better plan. I got a better plan. You go to this place or that place and play football, you might get a broken leg and then you're done with whatever. But my plan is you could be 60 years a priest and that's a good program. That was God's plan. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. But later on, looking back, oh my God, that God was with me in the darkness better than, 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 than any championship that I ever won. You know, you see him bouncing around. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was in my parish in, in uh, St. Rayfield's Parish in, in uh, Los Angeles, we had an a eighth grade basketball team that was fabulous. And, and they uh, were going to the finals. They, they were in the quarter five. They had to win the game. And if they won this game, they would go and play down, would be the same as the, the Staples Center's like the United Center here, you know, the big, where the Bulls play, well, that's where the Lakers play. So they were gonna have this grammar school game for the championship of the whole Los Angeles uh, Catholic school system at, at the Staples Center. And the parents are all biting their fingernails. And say, Father, will you pray for us? And he said, I will not. <laughs> I will not, and I hope they lose. <laughs> oh my God! They just, they <laughs> it was much better for the kids to lose than to win. It, it really is. It, it, I played with a lot. I, I played with with in high school with kids that won every year. The team, uh, the class ahead of me, they won every year. Their lives were messed up. Their lives were messed up by that. And I, 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 I think that young kids play in the staple center, you need a lot of maturity to be able to handle that. And I just as soon have them lose. And they did. And the parents loved me so that I could get away with it. But, <laughs> but uh, they said, Father Tracy is crazy, dude. He is crazy. Dude. But, but Father Tracy knew a little something about it that uh, 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 they were not hooking it. Okay, so uh, final paragraph. For most people, a good part of their journey as Christians is searching, uh, and searching people involves a transition uh, from, from uh, our plan for happiness to God's plan. We are clear with what we want and, and we think what we know. We've got to slowly open up to God. And how do we do that? The yearning for the presence of God knowledge of God's word, understanding of God's will, and the capacity to hear and obey and live. 
Oh, prayer. Deep prayer. Deep prayer is what takes you from this Bible class to your life experience and to understand God is with you all along. And so what the Bible class is doing without you being able to uh, put your finger on every little step along the way, which just sort of helps, uh, is, is that it's helping you understand that God is with you. There's nobody sitting here that isn't closer to understanding God's presence in your life. You, you can't help but encounter the Bible and know that God's with you. And, and that's why you keep on coming back. Yeah, yeah. You know, so uh, that's the point. Now, why did I do all of that today? Because in approaching the Psalms, the Psalms are absolutely magnificent prayers. They're the Word of God. They came out of the experience of 2,000 years of the journey of the Jewish people from Abraham to Jesus. But they're complex. They're difficult. They're wrapped up in the culture. So if you you read uh, Lead Me, Guide Me, the songs that Lead Me, Guide Me, are wrapped up in black history. They're wrapped up in the in the experience of the people. And if you don't know black history, a lot of those songs don't make sense. And same way with the Psalms. If you don't know the salvation history, the timeline and the story, of salvation that is from Abraham to Jesus, the Psalms, a lot of the Psalms don't make any sense. But if you know the story, then, then they get together. But deeper than the story is what I'm talking about here. Deeper than the story is, is that prayer is about us living God's word rather than having God live our word. Us doing God's will rather than having God do our will. Today. It's a long journey. A long journey, okay? So, even though you came late, it was worth the trip. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's, let's take some time to discuss this. Keep these pages. Now, let me do a little advertising before I close the shop. When I was in El Salvador, I had a little spare time, and, and I started, uh, I was reading a lot from Priests of Avila, and I said I would read, I was talking to this fellow that was a pastor that was, was a genius, he had a doctorate in anthropology from the University of Chicago, and he said, I'd really like to get people to talk about this, this the wonderful stuff that Teresa of Avila is teaching us about prayer. He said, well, you ought to start a blog. And I said, what the hell is a blog? <laughs> and a blog is, is uh, uh, a writer puts a little selection on the internet. And people, you, you give a, a theme, and people come and read it on their own. And so I started the blog, and gradually, you know, I did no advertising or other, just, just kept on writing about this stuff right there. That, that. And for the first four years, I ultimately raised where I got to about 120 people a day. And so in the first four years, I get, every two weeks it's on Google uh, that gives you a report, and I, got, I get a report every two weeks. And it tells how many people visited the, the site. And so, in uh, the first four years, I got 117,000 people visited the site, which is a nice little number to add. Uh, and so, but last month, as it continued to grow, it's now eight years old, last month, I got 123,000 in one month. Wow. And now, I'm getting 4,000 a day. And that's because people are hungry for, for what I'm talking about. They don't know where to get it, but some, some hook on. And, and so, but I'm afraid, I'm afraid to advertise 
because I don't know if I'm going to be up tomorrow to do it. Yeah. It takes a lot of energy, and it takes uh, uh, a lot of... Uh, you don't want to go to court like Trump. I don't want to go to court by Trump. I got nothing to do with Trump. <laughs> okay, so, but my point is, if you know anything about the internet, this, what I just read, is two weeks of my, my blog. Just two weeks of the blog. And, and I've got on there close to 300 of those things. So it's a resource for deep personal prayer on all kinds of ways, approaches, problems, difficulties, encouragement on prayer. And so uh, if you want to write down the thing that, that you can, the easiest way to do it is this. Go to Google and say, praying alone together. And when you have that, Google will bring you right away to that to my website. If you want the technical uh, address of the website, it's praying alone together. Wait, let me get it. Yeah, I got, I got the, I got the card. Here. Pray along together. Uh, dot. Then blog spot is one word. B L O G S P O T dot com. So it's. I can't. I'm sorry. I can't hear you. Okay, now, here's some more good news. You can get to the blog from Our Lady of Africa's website. So it's, it, it, if you go to Our Lady of Africa, there's, a, there's an outlet that goes into the blog. Okay? Now, one, one more business activity. Two weeks from today is, is the last class of this session. I want to take a break because I need a break. Uh, I'll do the blog and do this and do some other stuff. And, and uh, I'm actually getting older. Oh, really? <laughs> Every day. Oh, I, I hardly got time between doctor visits to do anything. <laughs> I'm going to ask you next week is if we take six weeks break between May 15th, that'll bring us into July. Yes. And do you want to start in July? I mean, I, 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 I'll give you a, I'll give you a couple of options and you can vote on them next week. Okay? But think about think about what what you want to do. Uh, if it's going to be a four-week or a six-week break between now and the next session. And, and I'll give you uh, a, a paper to vote on it, and we'll go with the majority. Okay? Very good. So let's, let's get, uh, have a discussion. There's a lot to talk about.